So, this is a disclaimer. There are very good reasons why this video should not be included in this series whatsoever. However, as the Republic of Crimea is de facto, if not de jure, part of the Russian Federation, I have included it thus. This video is not an endorsement of what's happened in Crimea, nor is it rebuttal. It is simply an overview of the history, culture and economy of the region. Similarly, this video will be about the Republic of Crimea, not the city of Sebastopol. That itself will be a later video unto itself as it is its own federal subject. I hope you can still enjoy this video and hopefully find some useful information herein. Hello, my name is Andrew and welcome back to All About Russia. In today's video, we're going to be looking at the contested Republic of Crimea. The Republic of Crimea, or Kirim Jumhurieti in Crimean Tatar, is located in the south of Russia, in the southern federal district and in the North Caucasian economic region. Within the Russian Federation, it shares borders with the city of federal importance Sevastopol to the south, and is connected to the neighbouring Krasnodar Krai via the Kerch Bridge. Internationally, it shares borders with the Republic of Ukraine to the north, though there are many who dispute it has any international borders. The Republic is over 10,000 square miles in size, making it the 69th oy oy, largest federal subject and larger than the nation of North Macedonia. As of the 2014 census, there are a little shy of 2 million people living there, making it the 26th most populous federal district and more populous than the nation of Latvia. The capital of the Republic is Simferopol, which roughly translates to City of Benefits, and as of the 2014 census, had a population of over 330,000 people. The Republic of Crimea, which dominates the Crimean Peninsula, is primarily steppe land, with most of that being found in the north. Around 20% of the land is mountainous, with around 8% of the entire peninsula consisting of water sources. The highest point in the Republic is Mount Roman Kosh, which in the Crimean language translates to something like Forest Corral, and stands at over 1,500 metres high. The longest river in the Republic is the River Salhir, at over 127 miles long. The name Crimea, or Krim in Russian, ultimately derives from one of two sources. Either it came from an old Turkic word, Kirim, which means uh, to protect or defend, or it came from a much older source, the Chimeros, an ethnic group living in the region when the Greek colonizers first arrived in the 5th century. As the homeland of the Crimean Tatars, Crimean Tatar is an official language within that republic, alongside Ukrainian and Russian. It is worth noting that even before the 2014 annexation, Russian was the dominant language in the region and had been for quite a few years, for reasons we will explain later in this video. As of the 2014 annexation, the region runs on Moscow Standard Time. Before this, it actually ran on Kiev Standard Time. The flag of the Republic is a horizontal tricolour of blue, white and red. These colours can be understood two ways. The first with the red representing the bloody and turbulent past of the region, the white representing peace, and the blue being the bright future of the peninsula. Alternatively, this flag can be understood as the same colours as the Russian flag, the mother country of many of the people living in the Crimean Peninsula. The huge white part of this flag is actually because a very controversial griffin was withdrawn at the 11th hour when they decided to elect this flag as the national flag. The reason for this, funnily enough, was because the Crimean authorities decided it would be too difficult for housewives to sew onto homemade banners. The flag was adopted on the 24th of September 1992. The Republic is administered in 24 regions, with the capital, Simferopol, acting as its own administrative district. Many of these administrative districts have both Ukrainian names, which are quite similar to the Russian names, and Crimean Tatar names, which are less so. Humans first arrived in Crimea around 80,000 years ago, 
and we know this from archaeological evidence found in the Kiyakoba caves. Who these first people were we may never know, although archaeology as well as Greek sources identify some of the people living in the area from at least 1000 BC as being the Tori in the southern part of the peninsula and the Scythians in the northern part of the peninsula. As just mentioned, our first written sources come from the Greeks, who arrived in the region around the 7th century BC. These Greek settlers came to colonise the region and quickly established several small city-states along the southern coasts, particularly in places such as Kerch, Symbola and Theodosia. Greek colonisation did not happen all at once, and over the centuries more and more Greeks arrived, settling further along the rich southern coasts. Relations between the Greeks, Taurisians and Scythians are subject to much theorization, and there is at least some evidence of trade, cultural exchange, as well as conflict between the three. In 513 BC, our first confirmation of conflict in the region arises, with evidence of a Persian expeditionary force being sent to the peninsula to punish Scythians for raiding against the growing Persian Empire at that time. What we do know was a unification of Greek settlements in the east occurred under Archinax I. This also first mentions the Chimeros people, a possible source for the term Crimea. By the 3rd century, a new kingdom had arisen in the rich southern plains of Crimea, the Bosporan Kingdom. Under Satyros Spartacos, a potential Thracian mercenary began to unite and expand the rich southern Greek cities. Interestingly, his capital, Scythianiopolis, was founded during this period and highlights the diversity present in Crimea at this time, as well as casting some doubts about the Greekness of this new kingdom. The Bosporan kingdom would exist for over a century more before falling in 120 BC to the kingdom of Pontus, another Hellenized state from North Anatolia. Historians are not quite sure why the Bosporan kingdom fell. However, one theory is that relations with the nomadic Scythians to the north may have deteriorated, weakening the state to invaders. The Pontic kingdom would continue to dominate Crimea from their base in Anatolia, but conflicts with Rome from 67 BC onward led to war returning to Crimea, and by 47 BC the Pontic kingdom was a vassal state and southern Crimea was under the rule of Rome. The Romans created the province of Moesia Inferior and moving the capital from Neopolis to Chersonesos, Roman rule saw the province, never a poor place, have a boon in both wheat production and wine cultivation. Furthermore, slavery, always a part of the economy of the region since at least the Hellenized period, flourished under Roman rule. Curiously, it was whilst under Roman rule that the first Jews arrived in Crimea, having been cast out of Judea at the time. This will have important repercussions later in Crimean history. Rome's power in the region waxed and waned, and by the 3rd century AD, Gothic tribes had begun invading the region, sacking Scythian Neapolis in around 250 AD. Whilst Gothic tribes began moving into this region, they were not the only ones to do so, and by 376, the overlord of many of the Gothic tribes, the Huns, arrived in Crimea. Hunnic power in the region only lasted until the death of Attila himself, but the Gothic tribes who migrated into the region would remain an important presence for, for many years onwards. Hybridization seems to be a common theme throughout Crimean history, from the Scythians and the Greeks, to the Romans and the Greeks, to the Romans and the Gothic tribes. When the Romans returned in 551 AD, the Gothic tribes bowed to Byzantine power, becoming another part of the Roman Empire again. Gothic Byzantine power would continue in the rich southern cities of Crimea up until the 7th century, when Bulgar tribes from the north invaded the region. The Bulgars at this time were a nomadic people living on horseback, and much like many of the other people before them who lived primarily in the saddle, they resided in the northern part of the peninsula, ravaging the rich southern cities for wealth. In 710 AD, the entire peninsula was absorbed into the expansive Khazar Khanate. This is an interesting episode in Crimean history, as from Byzantine sources, it seems that the Bulgars scattered before the power of the Khazars, 
whereas the Byzantine-aligned city-states in the south actually appealed to the Khazars for protection. The reason for this appeal comes from the fact that many of the cities in the south of Crimea had backed the wrong horse in a Byzantine civil war and were fearful of the revenge of Justinian II. The Khazars would dominate the region but leave little cultural legacy. And Byzantine was able to wrest back control of its southern colonies by 830 AD, creating the Curzon Thema. Thus Crimea was split between the nomadic Khazars in the north and Byzantine powers in the south. As Khazar power waned further, expansive Russian princes from the north looked to the warm and fertile Crimean lands. In 988 AD, Kievan Rus forces under Vladimir the Great invaded, sieging Chernossus and seizing Tumtarakan from the Byzantines. This would be the first time that any Slavic forces willingly entered Crimea, having previously only ever arrived as slaves. It would also see the first Russian state in Crimea in the princedom of Tumtarakan. The Romans would not take this line down, however. They would eventually retake to Mutarakan in 1083, with Prince Oleg actually swearing fealty to the Byzantines. Given the resurgence of the Byzantine Empire at that time, and the discord among the Kievan Rus princes, this switch in fealty actually makes a lot of sense, particularly since it allowed Prince Oleg to retain his position. As the Scythians, Bulgars and Khazars had done before, in the 11th century incursions into the steppe lands of North Crimea were undertaken by the Cumans. This would put them in contact with the rich southern coastal cities of Byzantium, and a steady stream of slaves and horses would fill the coffers of Constantinople. The year 1204 saw a huge shift among the Byzantine world, with the Fourth Crusade sacking Constantinople, seen as many as the heart of Christendom at the time. This too affected Crimea, as Alexios and David Komenos seized Trebizond to the south, creating the separate Trebizond Empire. This would go on to encompass the Kursan Thema within the year. The Cumans, who had been arriving in the Crimean Peninsula since the advent of the 11th century, grew and grew in number, eventually reaching an accord with the Byzantine cities of the south. However, the reason that more and more Cumans had been arriving in Crimea in the first place was that they were fleeing something something to the east. In 1238, the Mongols stormed into Crimea, vassalizing the Byzantine Gothic settlements in the south of the peninsula and ruling the easternmost part directly. Later, this would be incorporated into the Golden Horde as the Crimean Ulus, with the new regional capital established at Old Krim, potentially the first time this term was used for the entire peninsula. Mongol rule in Crimea was fairly light, grazing their horses in the northern steppe land and leaving the southern settlements alone, so long as tribute was paid on time. As such, this hybridised Byzantine Gothic population remained dominant in the south of Crimea. 1261 saw the arrival of the Genoese for the first time in the Black Sea, having been given trading rights by the then Byzantine Empire. That the Byzantines effectively had no power in the Black Sea now seems to have been a moot point. The Genoese came to an arrangement with the Mongols, buying a small plot of land in the former Greek colony of Theodosia and renaming it Kaffa. This would go on to become one of the world's largest slave emporiums at that time, seeing tens of thousands of Ruthenians, Caucasians, pretty much anyone they can get their hands on being sold to the markets of Istanbul and Alexandria. Violence was never far away in Crimea, and in 1299, Nogai Khan ravaged the region for failing to pay the correct tribute. And in 3047, the Mongols besieged Kaffa for not paying the correct amount of tribute. As a tactic to break the Genoese holding out, they fired dead bodies over the walls. These dead bodies, however, were infected with plague. And it is from this siege that the Black Death entered Europe, killing millions. Naturally, the peninsula was not spared either, and the bodies began to mount up, and there were more dead than alive. In 1381, after losing a trade war with their rivals Venice, Genoese influence in the Black Sea began to diminish. It was becoming harder and harder for them to actually send ships out into the Black Sea. Things were not helped when in 1395, Timerlane pillaged the region for aligning itself with the Golden Horde. Diminishing influence and their ability to protect the southern cities of Crimea 
led to several Gothic cities broaching the idea of independence. This culminated in several of the Gothic cities united in opposition to Genoa, as the Greek-speaking Principality of Theodoro, owing fealty to distant Constantinople, in feuding and war between the southern and eastern coastal Genoese cities, and the western interior Principality will continue for some years, both paying tribute to the Mongols of the Golden Horde. But the Mongols themselves were facing instability, and in 1420, the Tartar tribes who had settled in Crimea began fighting the authority of the weakened Golden Horde. By 1441, the Golden Horde's power in Crimea was gone, and the Khanate of Crimea under Hasigaray was formed. The Tartar tribes were autonomous in nature, however, and it would take another eight years for Hasigaray to cement himself as the leader of all the Crimean Tartar tribes. This marks the beginning of another epoch of Crimean history, that dominated by the Crimean Tartars. The Crimean Tartars have the misfortune of a somewhat misleading name, as they were only ever partially made up of Tartars at any one time. Perhaps a better name might be Tartarized Crimeans, as among their ranks you could also find Jews, Goths, Greeks, Romans and dozens of other nationalities all dominated by the Tartars who resided there. I will explore them more in our video on the Crimean Tartars themselves, but for now what is worth noting is that they arrived in 1238 with the Mongol hordes, and since that time expanded their influence and culture on the peoples of Crimea around them. The rise of the Crimean Tartars is pivotal in the story of Crimea for several reasons. Firstly, it saw the dramatic rise in and devastating effect of slave raids upon pretty much all of their neighbours. Much of southern Ukraine and Russia were thoroughly depopulated in the centuries of Crimean Tatar dominance. This was partly to sate and pay off the autonomous tribes of the Khanate and secure their loyalty, but in some respects this was just a continuation of one of the oldest economic practices in Crimea. Secondly, it saw the consolidation of Islam in the peninsula, having been introduced to the Crimean Tatars from the Ottoman Turks somewhere around the 13th century. The same year as power was consolidated by Hasigaray, the Akmehet Mosque was constructed as both a symbol of piety but also of power. In 1453, another epoch came to a close, with distant Constantinople falling to the Ottoman Turks. The conquest of Trebizond eight years later led to the Principality of Theodora being the last Byzantine Roman state in the known world and the Ottomans were coming. In 1475, after a five-month siege, the Principality fell before the cannons of the Ottomans. The Principality, as well as the Genoese city-states along the coast, were absorbed by the Ottoman Empire. What's more, having quite good relations with the Crimean Tatars, from whom the Ottoman Sultan would purchase tens of thousands of slaves every year, the Ottoman Sultan was somewhat annoyed. The reason he was annoyed was that the Crimean Tatars had not aided sufficiently in the capture of the Principality of Theodora. With his army still fresh in Crimea, he actually imprisoned the then Khan of the Crimean Tatars, Menli I, and forced him into a position of vassalage. This put the Ottoman Sultan as overlord of any Khan of Crimea, and would see increasing Ottoman involvement over the next few centuries in Crimean affairs. In 1500, the Crimean Tatars made a pact with a little-known power to the north of them, Muscovy. Essentially, they were paid off by the Muscovites to turn their attention to a mutual enemy of theirs, the Lithuanians. When the Crimeans attacked, thousands of people were taken as prisoner and sold off by the Tatars, funding Crimean trade, arts and social cohesion. Two years later, Mongol hopes of returning to Crimea were dashed, when Sheikh Ahmed of the Golden Horde was defeated with his army by Menli I. The next 80 years would see the Crimean Khanate prosper, as increasing slave raids led to increasingly filled coffers, which enabled them to hire craftsmen and artisans to improve the capital, Bakhchisarai. In 1507, the first slave raid against Moscovy occurred, capturing thousands. This would repeat almost yearly, culminating with the Crimean Tatars actually burning distant Moscow in 1571. This would prove to be the furthest extent of Crimean Tatar power, as the following year, the Battle of Malothi 
separated the Crimean Tatars irrevocably from other Tatar nations on the Volga. Whilst insignificant at the time, this would actually prove to be a major problem for the Crimean Khanate, as it essentially left them isolated from other Tatar nations, forcing them to face Muscovy's wrath alone. Slaves captured in these raids were mostly sold to the markets of Istanbul and Alexandria, although a substantial number remained in Crimea as farm slaves or in the harems of various khans and bays of Crimea. This influx of new blood kept the region diverse, and whilst Tatars remained the dominant ethnic group, Russian, Greek and Jewish communities could be found in the region even then. From 1580 onward, Slavic settlers, fleeing the powers of Moscovy and Lithuania, began drifting back into the vacant lands north of the Crimean Khanate, gradually evolving into tight-knit communities who defended them and theirs fiercely. Cossacks, as we call them today. The relationship between these proudly independent people and the Crimean Khans was troubled, with alternate raiding and trading occurring over the centuries, as each waxed and waned in power. Somewhat resting on their laurels, the Crimean Khans became ever more and more dependent on their overlords, the Ottomans. The first clang of the Bell of the Klein perhaps occurred in 1699, when the Treaty of Karlovitz between the Ottomans and a coalition of Christian European powers outlawed slave raids. This affected the Crimean Khanate greatly, as it made their slave raids illegal and thus punishable by neighbouring powers without Ottoman support. Nevertheless, the Crimean Tatars continued to raid Ukraine and southern Russia, and in 1736 this led to another war with the Crimean Khanate. The Ottomans, despite having signed the Treaty of Karlovitz, actually supported the Crimean Tatars in this war. And thus, for the first time since the 11th century, Russian soldiers entered Crimea willingly and burned the Tatar capital of Bachisarai. Whilst this marked a slide in the power between the Crimean Tatars and the Russians, the Russians could only pillage the region, not hold it. With the construction of forts across Russia and Ukraine, the power of Crimean raiding was reduced. And in 1769, the last true Great Crimea raid was committed upon Russia snatching 20,000 slaves for the market Istanbul and Alexandria. In June of 1773, in yet another Russo-Turkish war, Russian troops broke through the barriers and entered Crimea, burning and pillaging as they went. Ottoman power too was waning. The Treaty of Kushuk Kainasa forced the Ottomans to release the Khan of Crimea as an independent entity. The Crimean Tatar tribes who, may I remind you, used much of the slave raiding money to keep themselves together and unify, were at this time as divided as ever. No sooner had independence been forced and Sahib Garay appointed as Khan, his cousin Devlek Garay stormed across the Kerch Strait with an army, rallying the tribes for him. Within weeks, he had seized the Khanate, and the Tsarist of Russia, Catherine the Great, recognised him as the rightful Khan. The Crimean Tatars, who were Sunni Muslims, did not want to suddenly become independent and wanted to be part of the Ottoman Empire with the head, the caliph, the religious leader of the Islamic world. Their letters of request were rejected, however, by the Ottomans, who only too well realised the immediate war that would occur from such an action of allowing them to rejoin. However, just by sending letters asking to be included into the Ottoman realm proved to be too much. And Sahib Garay, yes, that Sahib Garay, who had been driven out of Crimea by his cousin, was put back into place with a Russian army behind him. Faced with overwhelming force, the disunified Crimean tribes reluctantly accepted Sahib as their Khan. Many of the Crimean Tatars saw Sahib as a Russian bootlicker, and this was only proven when he encouraged Russian settlement in Crimea and attempted to modernise the tribal feudal state. This went about as well as you might expect, and the Tatar uprising that immediately followed was put down by the Russian garrison in Bakhchisarai in 1778. Interestingly, this revolt had involved all aspects of Crimean society, and the Crimean Pontic Greeks, an ethnic group that had been in Crimea since the first days of Greek colonisation, were exiled to Russia for their role in financing the revolt. Crimea remained on eggshells for the next few years, with the Tatar nobility reluctantly accepting Sahib and his Russian overlords. 
In 1781, the Tartar nobility led a revolt against Sahib. Sahib attempted to use his own personal army to put this down. But when they pretty much to a man defected to the Tartar nobles, he once again called upon Russia. Weak Crimea had meant a strong Russia. And since 1774, Russia had been happy to support a client Khan. However, with the evident instability in Crimea, thoughts and words began to circulate in the courts in Moscow of perhaps a new approach, a different idea, a new Russia. In 1783, the Tsardom of Russia officially annexed Crimea, including it into their realm. The Khan of Crimea was expulsed from the region without much ado. Only the Ottoman Empire officially protested. This period saw the flight of many Crimean Tatars to the Ottoman Empire. There were around 300 noble Tatar families found service in the Russian army. At this point, the population of Crimea stood at around 60,000 people. And so Catherine the Great resettled thousands of Russians, Ukrainians and other ethnic groups in the region, beginning the Russification of Crimea. Furthermore, German farmers and Italian winemakers were also invited, with around 30,000 of the former and 25,000 of the latter settling in Crimea. The following year, modern Simferopol was founded, renaming the Tartar settlement that had been there. The entire region was put into the Torida Blast. This would last until 1796, when fears of the Crimean Tartars acting as a fifth column in any future Russo-Turkish wards led to the region being incorporating into the new Russian government. The defeat of the Ottomans three years earlier had cemented Russian claims in Crimea and thus emboldened the Tsarina to begin a vast shipboarding project in the south of the peninsula, creating the Black Sea Fleet. In 1801, Simferopol was appointed the capital of the peninsula and the following year the region was returned to the Torida governorate as fears of Tartar revolt diminished. As immigration continued, so too did the Russification of the region, with new amenities and Russian shops emerging. Immigration had such an impact on the region, in 1830, quarantine was imposed across many of the towns and cities of Crimea for fear of cholera, which was ravaging much of southern Russia at that time. This in turn was extremely unpopular and saw riots in several places, including the capital Simferopol, that year. 1853 would prove to be a black year for Crimea, as it saw the start of the Crimean War against the Ottomans, French and British. Brought on by disputes about rights of Christians in the Balkans of all things, it was not until 1854 that foreign troops actually landed in Crimea. The Franco-British domination of the Black Sea, as well as superior forces, made it hard for Russia to effectively drive the foreigners from the peninsula despite using Simferopol as their headquarters. Quickly, southern Crimea was effectively under Franco-British control, with the northern stepland still in Russian hands. As time dragged on, so did the soldiers resolve. And after several significant battles in 1855, both Kerch, an important town offering resupply from Krasnodar and Sevastopol, the main seaport of the region, fell. The fall of Sevastopol was seen as the death knell of the conflict by many, and peace was made the following year. The Franco-British occupation of Crimea left a strange legacy, with many of the churches in Crimea suddenly finding themselves missing their bells. Note, the role Crimean Tartars played in the conflict is much debated, with competing claims of collusion with the Franco-British forces, as well as those who claim the Tartars served to harry the invaders. In 1861, the same year the serfs were emancipated, Tsar Alexander II made a purchase in Crimea. The purchase was the Livadia Palace, and it was to serve as a summer residence for the Tsar. This minor purchase heralded the start of another epoch in Crimean history, that of the tourist destination. More and more of the Russian aristocracy began arriving in Crimea to relax away from the maddening crowd of the capital. And 13 years later, in 1874, Simferopol was linked by rail, allowing greater numbers of the Russian nobility and upper classes to visit the mountains, beaches and spas of Crimea. By the time of the 1897 census, two thirds of the population were of Slavic nationalities of the Russian Empire. 
excluding Crimean Tatars, who stood at around a third. The 1905 revolution saw unrest in Crimea, and railway workers began striking both Simferopol and Sevastopol. In Simferopol, 40 Jews were lynched in a sudden pogrom, a bleak reminder of the wide anti-Semitism that was prominent at that time. The unrest in Crimea was put down by Tsarist troops, but showed that Crimea was a politically aware and connected part of the Russian Empire. At the advent of the First World War, the population in Crimea had boomed to around 800,000 people, with half of those being Russians and a quarter Crimean Tatars. Whilst opposite the central power of Turkey, the region was relatively isolated during the war, with the Black Sea Fleet keeping much of the Ottoman force away from Crimean shores. In July 1917, the situation in Russia was dire, with the central powers encroaching and revolution in the air. Thousands of refugees were pouring into Crimea weekly. When Alexander Kerensky formed a new provisional government in St. Petersburg, so too did the Crimean Tatar intelligentsia create the Mili Firka Party, advocating for more autonomy for Crimea within the new Russian Republic. With the Bolshevik coup in November, the Crimean Tatars publicly formed the Crimean People's Republic on the 13th of December as an autonomous region within the Russian Republic, loyal to the provisional government. Its president was Norman Shelebisehan, who also wrote the anthem for the Crimean Tatar people and officially was an equal state for Russians, Ukrainians and Crimean Tatars. However, this was not the utopia it claimed to be and Crimean Tatar dominance in government encouraged Russian unrest. Three days later, on the 16th, Bolshevik forces rose up in Sevastopol, taking that city. Warfare erupted in the peninsula. And by January of 1918, the Bolsheviks had captured Simferopol. The Torida Soviet Socialist Republic was declared in March of that year, headed by Jan Miller as president and pointedly excluded Tatars from government. This was in direct response to the way Crimean Tatars had behaved when they were in government. Events in Crimea were not isolated from Russia nor the wider world. And in April of 1918, a combined Ukrainian-German offensive stormed through Crimea, purging the Bolshevik leadership. The chickens had well come home to roost, and the Crimean Tatars rose with the invaders to help purge the Bolsheviks, who were largely ethnic Russians, and this would sow seeds of ethnic discord that would be reaped about 30 years later. By June, they had complete control of the region and declared another government, the Crimean Regional Government, with Makiez Solkiewicz as its Prime Minister. Except this state was directly under German protection and was only nominally independent. This state of affairs would exist for a few months more, with officially harmony between the Crimean and Slavic population there. However, there are several anecdotes of excesses Crimean Tatars committed against the Slavic nationalities living in Crimea under German protection, of course. As the German defeat by the Allies became more and more likely and Bolshevik power grew in the north, talks began between the Crimean regional government and the People's Republic of Ukraine about potentially federalization, calling their resources against outside aggressors. These talks broke down and the following month, the German forces in Crimea withdrew. Makiej left his position as well, returning to his native Azerbaijan, leaving a Crimean Karik Jew, Solomon Krim, in charge. In lieu of German support, Anglo-French troops landed in the southern city of Sevastopol, arriving to help bolster the rump state. But as Bolshevik forces surged through Ukraine in January, the writing was truly on the wall. Bolsheviks, both Russian and Ukrainian, stormed into Crimea in March. By April, the Franco-British forces had evacuated themselves, not looking to die for a theoretical independent state, and it would take only until May to fully occupy the region. Learning from the mistakes of the first Bolshevik state in Crimea, the Crimean Socialist Soviet Republic was founded that May, with Dmitry, Lenin's younger brother, as chairman of the Soviet, allowing Tatars of communist persuasion into government as well. The excesses against the Crimean Tatar population were thus limited, and this uneasy peace remained for about a month. Anton Denikin, a leader of the white anti-Bolshevik army, landed in Koktebel in eastern Crimea in June of 1918, 
and by the end of the month had control of the entire peninsula. A traditional Tsarist officer, he associated Judaism with communism and led several pogroms against the Karait Jews of Crimea, a people who had lived there since Roman times. Administratively, it was put as part of the larger general command of the armed forces of South Russia, though in February of 1920, this was changed to the government of South Russia, with Sevastopol put as the headquarters of this force. This was partly because Denikin had resigned by this point and Pyotr Rangel, another white officer, had assumed command. The war was turning against the white forces, however, and Crimea remained one of the last outposts against communism in Eastern Europe. By November 1920, a titanic Bolshevik force had again broken into Crimea. Anglo French ships helped evacuate those of white aligned sympathies, and around 146,000 Russians, Jews, Crimean Tatars, Ukrainians, Greeks, as well as others were evacuated from the peninsula, never to return. So let's just recap. From the period of 1917 to 1920, within Crimea, it had experienced seven different governments, four invasions, two uprisings, and one case of genocide. Obviously, this was a very tumultuous period, and tens of thousands died from the conflict, tens of thousands more dying from disease and hunger. Yet sadly, the plight of the region was not at an end. In October 1921, the Crimean Autonomous Socialist Soviet Republic was founded within the Russian Soviet state. Simferopol was reconfirmed as the capital of the region, and a process of Tartarization, common in areas with high numbers of ethnic minorities, promoting Crimean Tatars to position of regional governance. The ravages of war had ruined much of the agriculture in Crimea, and thus Jews from other parts of the Tsarist Empire were encouraged to settle in Crimea and in farming colonies. Nevertheless, starvation was faced by many within Crimea, as food was exported to other large cities in the Soviet Union, such as Kiev, St. Petersburg, and of course, Moscow. Crimean Tatar sources cite as many as three quarters of the victims who died from starvation were Crimean Tatars, though this is by no means definitive proof. In the 1926 census, five years after the end of violence in the peninsula and with encouraged emigration, the population stood at only 720,000 people, 80,000 less than in 1914. In 1927, the region was rocked by two terrible earthquakes. Though killing only a handful, the havoc wrecked across the southern cities prompted waves of reconstruction in the Soviet fashion. Two years later, the region received a relatively minor change in that the name of the republic was changed to the Crimean Autonomous Soviet Socialist Republic. But this was not the only change that occurred. The Tartarization of Crimea was henceforth stopped. The Crimean intelligentsia purged and massive industrialization efforts enacted across the peninsula. This saw hundreds of influential Crimean Tatars shot or removed from office at the same time that enormous metallurgical and chemical plants were created across the Crimean Peninsula. These drew in thousands of workers from across the Soviet Union. Once again, the city of Sevastopol became the headquarters of the Black Fleet and a flurry of shipbuilding occurred across Crimea. In June of 1941, the Second World War came to Russia as Nazi Germany launched an enormous lightning assault across the breadth of their vast border with the Soviet Union. By August, they had advanced so far that 60,000 Crimean Germans, a people who had lived in Crimea since the 18th century, were deported and treated as enemies of the state by virtue of their nationality alone, for fear of being a German fifth column. By October, the Wehrmacht were in Crimea, having ravaged Ukraine en route. Sevastopol, with its access to the Black Sea, resisted for longer, falling in 1942, after 250 days of siege, when orders to evacuate were finally given. And this is where, again, it becomes quite controversial. With Crimea wholly under German control by 1942, they began to recruit domestically to help administer and police the region. Interestingly, the Germans actually had a plan to create an entirely homogenous German ethnic state in Crimea, but Soviet partisans 
were active from the offset, operating out of the mountains and trying to disrupt German movements. To help police and punish the Soviets who were resisting, they turned to local recruitment. And who did they recruit? The Crimean Tatars. Estimates range from a few hundred up to 10% of the Crimean Tatar population collaborated with the Nazis, committing atrocities against ethnic Russian and Ukrainian villages. The Jewish farmer colonies, as well as those Karite Jews, who again had been in Crimea since Roman times, began to be systematically exterminated as well. Inevitably, the tide of the war began to turn, and in April of 1944, amid fierce fighting, the Soviets re-entered Crimea. As the Germans retreated, they took a number of Crimean Tatars and their families, mainly those who had collaborated with them in their journey westward back to Germany proper. By May, the Soviets had completely recaptured the peninsula and the role of Crimean Tatars in the three-year-long occupation was both fresh and painful in the Soviet collective memory. Between the 18th and the 20th of May, around 191,000 Crimean Tatars, as well as 37,000 other nationalities, such as Greeks, Bulgarians and Armenians, were forcibly deported from Crimea. As had been done to the Crimean Germans three years earlier, they were packed onto cattle trains with barely any food or water, pretty much whatever they could grab before leaving the house, and were deported to the deserts of Kazakhstan and Uzbekistan. This, in Crimean Tatar folk memory, is the Sogunlik, or exile, and would leave a profound impact on the region both in terms of demographics, culture, and politics. In November 1944, a bridge was built connecting Krasnodar and Crimea. This was to improve the access and to help rebuild the war-ravaged region. Whilst the freak ice drift, yes, ice, in Crimea, destroyed the bridge in February 1945, it proved that such a construct was possible, something we have seen in recent times. That same month, the famous Yalta Conference was held between Stalin, Churchill and Roosevelt to decide the layout of post-war Europe. At this point, the population of Crimea stood at around 379,000 people. In 1939, it had been over a million. On the 30th of June 1945, the Crimean Autonomous Soviet Socialist Republic was abolished and was replaced by the Crimean Oblast with vast numbers of Ukrainians and Russians being encouraged to migrate to the region. With the rise of the Cold War, Sevastopol grew in importance. Being near the NATO ally of Turkey and being one of the best ports on the Black Sea, and was thus separated from the Crimean Oblast as a city of Union importance in 1948. In 1954, a relatively mild administrative change occurred involving the Crimean Oblast but it's one that would have major repercussions in the future. There is much debate about why this was done, some historians arguing that it was a unilateral decision by Khrushchev himself, who is fond of his native Ukraine, whilst others cite the practical relevance of its proximity to the Ukrainian mainland. Nevertheless, on the 26th of April, the Crimean Oblast was ceded to the Ukrainian SSR, instead of the Russian SSR. It should be noted there was no vote or debate about this decision. And whilst officially the reason given was a geographical one, there are many other factors which play a relevant role, something that can be explored in more detail in the video here. In the post-war world, Crimea returned to being a tourist hotspot, and the great and the good from the Soviet government would regularly holiday there. This brought wave after wave of building projects. And soon hotels, cafes and spas littered the sun-kissed beaches of the south of Crimea. Agriculture remained important in the region, and in an effort to improve the fickle water supply, in 1961 work began on the North Crimean Canal, allowing much of the arid stepland of the north in the peninsula to be put under plough. Finished in 1975, the canal used water from the Dnipro River in Ukraine to allow the irrigation of the region. Remember that fact as it will be important later on. In 1989, after literal decades of protesting and appealing to the Soviet government, the Supreme Soviet permitted the Crimean Tatars to return to Crimea. Since 1944, several attempts have been made by the Tatars to return both legally and illegally 
but with little success. Thus, when the edict was announced, over a quarter of a million of Crimean Tatars began their westward journey, nearly half of the entire population. We will explore this more in our video on the Crimean Tatars themselves, but suffice to say, when they returned, things were very, very different to how they had been left. Homes were largely gone or currently occupied by Slavic settlers, farms cultivated by new hands. As the deportation had been legal, there was little legal recourse and thus many Crimean Tatars moved further inland, away from their historic centres near the southern coasts. In a somewhat fitting coincidence, the return of the Crimean Tatars coincided with the end of the Soviet Union. And in January of 1991, a referendum was held. This referendum was to decide whether to restore the Crimean Oblast to the autonomous Soviet Socialist Republic of Crimea again, giving them certain powers as a republic over their own economy and legislation. This referendum came two months before the All-Union Referendum that would see the beginning of the end of the Soviet Union, and notably held clauses that allowed Crimea to secede if it wished. Once again, bear that in mind. In August 1991, amid the tumultuous political situation in Moscow, Mikhail Gorbachev decided to take a brief holiday with his family. Naturally, he chose a quiet, sunny spot in Crimea. What he didn't know is he had been followed by communist hardliners who were opposed to the changes he was making. In the August Putsch, they detained Gorbachev and tried to force him to reinstate the Soviet Union. This ended in failure for the communists three days later, but the political upheaval was not at an end. For three days after that, the Ukrainian Supreme Soviet declared its independence, taking Crimea with it. This was confirmed in a national referendum in December of that year, though it is notable that Crimea had the lowest percentage of support for this referendum at only 54%. This can be attributed to a few different factors. Some claim that the ethnic Russian dominance in the region made joining a foreign country such as Ukraine a strange prospect. Whilst others claim the Soviet mentality of agreeing to what the state suggests was still in force and many agreed simply because that was what they had always done. Other historians have claimed that the results were actually rigged. Nevertheless, the referendum passed and three months later in February of 1992, the Crimean ASSR became the Republic of Crimea. The relationship between the Republic of Crimea and Ukraine could best be described as fraught. Unrest in Crimea grew, and in May, the Supreme Council of Crimea held a referendum on becoming a sovereign entity within Ukraine, essentially a state within a state. This was challenged by the Ukrainian government, and by September, an agreement was made. In return for postponing the referendum, Note, not cancelling, just postponing. An agreement for more autonomy and economic aid to Crimea was given by the Ukrainian government. Yet two years later, with the election of Yuri Meshkov to the presidency of Crimea, the idea of sovereignty was raised again. Pressing for more autonomy, presidential power, and the right for citizens of Crimea to hold dual nationality of both Russian and Ukrainian, a referendum was organized and held. This actually passed on all three issues, but was declared illegal by Ukraine. What's more, Ukraine entered Crimea to reduce their autonomy, abolish the constitution that had been drafted in light of the referendum, and actually deported Meshkov back to Russia. The reasons given by the Ukrainian government were that the new constitution of Crimea violated the Ukrainian constitution. However, this still left a very bitter taste in the mouths of many Russian Crimeans. In 1997, the Treaty of Friendship was signed between Ukraine and Russia. This confirmed Crimea as Ukrainian territory, and alongside the US and Britain, agreed to respect the national borders as such. Once again, keep this in mind for later. In May of that year, the Black Sea Fleet was split 80-20 with Russia, who were also given basing rights in Sevastopol until 2017. This would be extended to 2042 a few years later. With the advent of the new millennium and stabilization in both Russia and Ukraine, growing NATO influence and interest in Crimea helped stir the pot of discontent. In 2006, anti-NATO protests erupted in Sevastopol, rejecting a planned combined US-Ukrainian military drill. Furthermore, 
Disputes between Ukraine and Russia over the price of gas led to supplies to Crimea being cut off, something many of the Russian Crimeans blamed the Ukrainian government for. In 2009, this developed into full-on anti-Ukrainian protests breaking out in Crimea, with some of the Russian Crimean population seeing Ukraine as siding against Russia and with NATO. What's more, many Russian Crimeans noted that whilst corruption on an everyday level in Russia had wound down since the 2000s, in Ukraine this was still a very present feature in daily life. As of 2012, a series of events occurred that would forever change Crimean history. These events, depending on your perspective and persuasion, may be over or understated, but still remain relevant nonetheless. On the 8th of August, Viktor Yanukovych, the then Ukrainian president, signed into being a Ukrainian language law, which allowed Russian to be used in all aspects of legal, business and political life in regions where the Russian-speaking population exceeded 10%, which as we can see, is a fairly large chunk of Ukraine. This was actually warmly received in Crimea, as it was seen as reassuring their Russian identity, but provoked unrest in much of Western Ukraine, where the law was seen as either not harsh nor pro-Ukrainian enough. In November of 2013, protests in Kiev erupted against Yanukovych, his perceived pro-Russian sentiment and the rampant corruption evident in Ukraine. As the situation unraveled in Kiev and became more and more violent, the chairman of the Supreme Council of Crimea, Vladimir Konstantinov, stated on a visit on the 20th February to Moscow that he would not rule out Crimea seceding from Ukraine if order could not be restored. The reason he stated this was because many Russian speakers who make up the majority in Crimea did not see the Euromaidan protests as an anti-corruption revolution, but instead as a quasi-fascist coup. Of note, his visit was not just a social call, and we now know that certain conversations about Crimea rejoining Russia were held. On the 22nd of February 2014, Yanukovych was ousted, fleeing via helicopter in the small hours to Russia. This was received poorly by many Russian Crimeans who, if nothing else, perceived Yanukovych as the legitimate president of Ukraine. That is not to say, however, Yanukovych was beloved by the Russian Crimeans, who noted his cronyism to the Donbass clique, a group of businessmen and politicians who hailed from the Donbass region. Four days later, on the 26th, fighting broke out in Crimea outside the Crimean parliament between pro and anti-maiden forces. This did have a racial element, with the pro-maiden forces being made up of Ukrainian and Crimean Tatars, whilst the anti-forces were made up of ethnic Russians. Over 20 people were taken to hospital and one man, who by all accounts was of an age, died of a heart attack due to the stress. The Crimean parliament was suspended until order could be restored, though what form that order would take would be a little surprising. The very next day, the infamous Little Green Men began appearing across Crimea, restoring order. These men, widely suspected of being Russian troops without insignia, filled out across the cities of Crimea, with armed gunmen entering the Crimean parliament. These gunmen, along with the members of the Crimean parliament, held a vote of no confidence in the Ukrainian government, though this was not universally approved, and ousted the then president of Crimea, Anatoly Mohilyov. This left acting deputy president, Sergei Aksionov, in charge, who officially asked Moscow to send troops to help maintain order on the 1st of March. This was approved unanimously by the Russian Duma that same day, and troops were sent immediately. On the 3rd of March, things escalated when those same little green men began systematically besieging Ukrainian bases and demanding a surrender. Now, dear viewer, if you are thinking there might be a link between Russia agreeing to send troops and militias suddenly besieging Ukrainian bases, you would be right to think so. Whilst officially these Russian-speaking troops were paramilitaries from Crimea itself, most of the international community does not believe this. Furthermore, this is seen by much of the international community as the beginning of direct Russian involvement in the Crimean crisis. On the 6th of March, the Crimean parliament officially asked to join Russia, citing their right in the 1994 constitution, as well as the previous Soviet constitution to secede if it so wished. This was accepted on condition of a national referendum in Crimea, 
and on the 16th of March that referendum was held. The questions posed in the referendum were whether to rejoin Russia or to restore their autonomy under the 1992 constitution. Needless to say, the referendum was incredibly controversial. Many Ukrainian Crimeans boycotted the referendum, with the Crimean Tatar Assembly expressly stating that it was illegitimate and to stay away from voting. Ukraine itself and much of the Western world stated the referendum as illegitimate and thus meaningless. This was also the stance the United Nations took, stating that only Ukraine had the authority to declare a referendum in the region and thus refused to send any state observers. Nevertheless, other observers from across Europe and beyond arrived to oversee the referendum. Sadly, even they reported several instances of being allowed to vote, despite not being Russian citizens and other electoral fraud. The referendum passed with over 96% of support. And on the 17th of May 2014, the Republic of Crimea declared independence from Ukraine, officially becoming a federal subject of the Russian Federation the following day. The Russian-speaking Crimeans celebrated with much jubilee, while Ukraine recalled all troops from the Crimean Peninsula. Amazingly, somewhere between 30 to 50% of Ukrainian troops stationed in Crimea actually defected to Russia, leaving a very bitter taste in many Ukrainian mouths. In that year, nearly 140,000 Russian citizens moved to Crimea, many of them being in the military with their families, as the clocks were changed to Moscow, not Kiev, time. A new bridge that would link the regions of Krasnodar and Crimea was begun. And despite international sanctions, huge investment into Crimea was made by dozens of Russian businesses, both state-sponsored and otherwise. Ukraine, meanwhile, did not sit on its hands, and around 60,000 Ukrainians and Crimean Tatars fled the region. Payments to workers and pensioners in Crimea were halted, which the Russians took up and actually doubled, and the Crimean Canal was closed. More worryingly, among the Crimean Tatar community, among those who chose to stay in Crimea to not have to leave their homeland for a second time, several prominent figures began to disappear. This is something the Russian state has denied is happening, but repeated missing person reports indicate that several members of the Crimean Tatar community are being targeted on a vast, almost statewide level. How long can a people ride on a sense of jubilation, I wonder? In 2015, those extra payments to pensioners and state workers ceased, the Duma having considered the region now properly integrated into the rest of Russia. With international sanctions, trade and travel to Ukraine and beyond became harder for the people of Crimea. By 2017, due to the Crimean Canal being closed, agriculture in the peninsula had shrunk to 14,000 hectares. Furthermore, water rationing was introduced in several cities, including the capital Simferopol. As of the time of recording, water is still an issue in Crimea, with the international sanctions not allowing many companies which specialize in desalination to construct works in Crimea. Furthermore, Russian companies, by and large, do not have a lot of experience in this industry, as Russia has historically not lacked water. It is genuinely hard to say whether today Crimea is prospering or suffering. Despite being declared a free economic zone by Russia in 2014, the region has needed money pumped into it and likely will for years to come. This is in large part because sanctions do not allow many international companies to work in the region due to the dispute about its legal status, and thus most things are imported from Russia or Russian-aligned nations. In 2019, it provided just half a percent of Russia's GDP, but this is actually a marked improvement on previous years. Another area where improvements have been made are in tourism, with repeated growth in numbers since 2015. In 2019, this actually peaked to nearly 7.5 million visitors, nearly all coming from Russia. The completion of the Crimean Bridge helped in this regard immensely, as before, the only ways to arrive were by plane or boat. As before stated, the closing of the Crimean Canal, which draws its water from the Dnipro River, has had a devastating effect on several industries, most notably farming. 
In 2014, it made up 15.9% of the GDP of the region. But every year since, the returns have diminished. An increase in mining and gas exploitation in the region have been enacted under Russian rule. And the southern port of Sevastopol has boomed as one of the largest shipbuilding and repair centers on the Black Sea. Domestic spending, too, has dramatically increased, with an influx of military personnel and their families in the region. When the Crimean Republic joined the Russian Federation in 2014, a census was held. It listed over 1.9 million people in the Republic of Crimea, with over 300,000 of those living in Simferopol alone. Of that number, 65.2% were ethnic Russians, 16% were Ukrainians, and 12.6% made up of Crimean Tatars. Of the remaining 6.2%, Belarusians, Armenians, and Tatars from elsewhere in Russia, in addition to a plethora of smaller nationalities, make up the remainder. Note that this was in 2014, and those demographics may be slightly shifted now. The birth rate in the region stood at 1.68 children per woman in 2014, which was lower than the 1990 rate. Unfortunately, I was not able to find any information on alcohol or drug misuses or abuses in the region. The main reason for this is such information is not normally collected in disputed areas. In the population census of 2014, they actually asked religious information as well and Orthodox Christians reported at 58% of the population. 15% declared themselves Muslim, with 13% declined to give any answer. Spiritual but not religious beliefs came in at 10%, both atheists and plethora of other answers coming in at around 2%. The head of the Republic is Sergei Aksyonov, who came to power in 2014, when the previous president, Anatoly Mohiliev, was ousted from power. He is an ethnic Russian, actually born in Moldova to the Russian community there, who first became a Ukrainian citizen in 1997, and then a Russian one in 2003. He is a bit of an unusual character, as he has ties to criminal gangs from the 1990s, who nicknamed him Goblin. His nickname is Goblin. Unfortunately, he is known for his anti-Ukrainian and homophobic comments. But that isn't a huge departure from Mohiliev, who is known for his anti-Russian and anti-Tartar comments. The Republic of Crimea is blessed with some absolutely astounding natural beauty, such as the Aipetri Mountains, the Golden Southern Beaches, and the Marble Cave. Furthermore, some of the architecture that can be discovered in Crimea is incredible, such as the remnant of the Khan's Palace in Bakhtisarai, the Greek ruins of Chersonesus in Sevastopol, and the astonishing swallow's nest overlooking the Black Sea. With such beauties, it's no wonder there has been conflict over the peninsula for centuries, nay, millennia, as Crimea remains a pearl of the Black Sea region. My name is Andrew, thank you for watching. If you've enjoyed the content thus far, perhaps think about liking the video or subscribing to get more videos like this one. Thank you for watching. Up next is the Republic of Dagestan. Baka.